in the last 10 days was that Suez Canal was all over the news. A huge crisis. A big ship, the mega ship, who blocked the whole Suez Canal, created a, a, a lot of traffic, if you want. It got stuck there, 365 ship from both sides were supposed to cross, and everything was, well, thank God, they were able to pull it out with the help of cranes digging out the, the dirt. And then on the 15th, I think, of the month, of the Jewish month, and it's a full moon, and the moon was very low, close to the earth, the tight, the water went up, and it were, were able to pull it out. To me, the Suez Canal is always associated with crisis. I grew up, I remember during Yom Kippur War, the fight was over the Suez Canal. That was effectively, that was the border between Israel and Egypt. But really the Suez Canal is involved with, is associated with crisis all the way from the beginning. In 1859, Egypt and France decided to build the Suez Canal. A French uh, company, build it, the help of the French government and the uh, uh, Egyptian government. Took 10 years to build, the, to build the Suez Canal. A million and a half Egyptian soldiers and um, workers. And it's estimated that 125,000 workers died during the 10 years from malaria and other kind of things. Fight finally in 1869, they inaugurated the, they opened the Suez Canal that connects basically between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, between Asia and Europe. That's why it's so important. It's the most important pathway in the world probably. Six years later, or five, six years later, the Egyptian leader, ruler, prime minister, whatever he was at that time, was in a crisis. He needed money very much, very desperately. He was a spender, he needed money. He decided he's going to sell the, the stocks, the interest that Egypt has, the control that Egypt has on the Suez Canal to the English government, to the British government, at that time a superpower. He sent an offer to Britain that he's ready to sell it for the amount what today's equivalent to half a billion dollars. Today it's nothing, but at that time, obviously it wasn't so important and half a billion, a billion dollars was a lot of money. What today is half a billion dollars. In any case, the prime minister in England at that time was Benjamin the Israeli, a Jewish guy. Who is Benjamin the Israeli? He was born to Jewish parents. His father was Isaac the Israeli. And he was a Jew and he belonged to a synagogue in London. He was a Jew who moved from Italy, his family at least moved from Italy from a, from a Sephardi family who moved to Italy. And one time something in the shul went wrong. They didn't want to give an aliyah to his son. It was a big fight, you know, the good fights. And he decided to take revenge in the rabbi and the gabba and the synagogue and the Jewish people and God, I don't know. He converted his kids to Christianity. He himself didn't convert, but he converted his children. Benjamin grew up, became a politician and eventually became the prime minister of Britain, of the Great Britain. And he was, very proud of his Jewish heritage. Not only wasn't embarrassed about it, not only didn't cover this up, he was proud of it. And when sometimes politicians used to, used to attack him, oh, you're a Jew. And he answered them very sharply. One time he answered to one of them, when, when, you, when, you, when your ancestors were raising pigs or something like this, my ancestors were writing the Bible and things like this. 
and he fought for the Jewish people, they should be equal citizens, they should have equal rights and so on. He was the prime minister when they offered to, to buy the Suez Canal came. He right away understood the huge opportunity there and he wanted to do it, but it was on Shabbat. You know, he's a Jew on Shabbat, everything is closed. The Bank of England was closed on Shabbat. The parliament is not in session. Even if the Bank of England is open, they need the parliament to approve this huge amount of money to give it to Egypt. He needed the money and the Egyptian ruler needed the money now. He couldn't wait a minute. He was very desperate for the money. And he sent his, his deputy to Rothschild, to the Baron Rothschild. And he came to Rothschild and he said, we need this amount of money. He says, who needs it? He says, the, God, the British government. He said, no problem. It was Shabbat, he told him after Shabbat, I'll write you a check for the full amount of money. He didn't ask for guarantors, for anything. For the, the British government wants it, they gave it. They bought the Suez Canal. A while later, the, the parliament approved it and he gave them, the, 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 the government gave the money back to Rothschild. In the, the, in the Egyptian memory, what was the story? Two Jews wrapped from them the, the Suez Canal. It was the Israeli Benjamin and Rothschild made, made a deal. And since then, the Suez Canal was controlled by French and England for almost, almost 100 years, until 1965, 19, 1956. From 1874, when they bought it, something like this, until, until 1956. At that time, Nasser decided to nationalize the Suez Canal, to announce that this belongs to Egypt, that Egypt's Egypt, uh, uh, land, and nobody else has right to it. And at the same time, he made another rule because he was in a fight with Israel. Egypt was in a fight in the war with Israel, that Israeli ship cannot pass at the Suez Canal. Now, England, France, and Israel had, something, had, had a common interest. Israel want to be able to use it to bring ship, to the ship should be able to pass by there, the Israeli ship. French in, 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 in England lost this huge control because whoever controls the Suez Canal already controls the whole this part of the world. That's how they stopped. That was partially the success against the Nazis because the Nazis couldn't go with their ship through the Suez Canal. That they came together secretly and they told Israel that Israel should make an attack against Egypt. And they provided Israel, especially France, with planes and soldiers and everything and ammunition. And then they will also get involved in the war. And they will, later they will be, so to speak, the peacemakers. They will tell Israel, go back from the Suez Canal. Tell the Egyptians, go back from the Suez Canal. And they will control again the Suez Canal as before. But they didn't work out. America, Eisenhower didn't like it, maybe because they didn't ask him. I don't know what the reason was. He forced Israel to retreat, retrieve, and also France in, in England to walk away. And he basically, they decided, the UN decided it belongs to Egypt, but the UN put some soldiers there. And Israel could not use it for, for Israeli ships could not pass by the Suez Canal until 1979, from 1956 until 1979. That was the first time the Israel could, you could use it again. In general, from six day war until 73 war, the Suez Canal was closed, nothing happened there. Because of the war, the Egypt put their forced 20 ship to stay there and no, they couldn't leave, there were ships from all over the world. They couldn't leave and nobody was able to go there until between 1967 till 19, until 1974, actually. In any case, this whole drama with the Suez Canal this week happened in the week of Pesach, when the Jewish people left Egypt. And where the, what was the cost? The, and Shabbos is going to read about the, 
the splitting of the sea, of the Red Sea. Right there was the whole, the whole story of, of uh, the Jewish people. The story of the splitting of the sea, everybody knows. People saw the movie, the Ten Commandments, thank God for the movie, they know the story. But when you read in the Torah, we read also on Shabbat, you're going to read after the splitting of the sea, they traveled for three days and they couldn't find water. And when they finally found water, they found bitter water. And they complained to Moses, we don't have water. Moses turned to God, he prayed to God. He cried out to God and God told them, take a piece of wood basically, throw it into the water and the water will turn into sweet water. The bitter water turned into sweet water. Interesting enough, when they were digging the Suez Canal, it was created because of the digging two uh, lakes, two bitter lakes, one a bigger one, one a smaller one. This is not the same bitter lakes that they found when the Jewish people left Egypt, came to a bitter, to bitter water, but it's around the same neighborhood. What happened at the bitter lake when the Jewish people turned the water into sweet water, when Moses turned the water to sweet water and everybody was drinking? And then when everybody relaxed, God gave him a few mitzvahs. He gave him an introduction to the Ten Commandment. He told him about the mitzvah of Shabbat, and he told him the mitzvah of honoring your father and mother. Was later was commandment number four and commandment, no, commandment, no, uh, commandment number five. Kind of an introduction to the Ten Commandment, a taste of it. It was, that was a month before, before, the ten, before Mount Sinai even maybe even more and then he gave them a promise god gave the jewish people a promise he said if you fulfill follow my commands and do what i'm asking from you all the sickness that i put on the egyptian i will not put on you and the egyptian talking about the biblical egyptian in egypt all the sickness all the plagues that i put on them i will not put on you because I'm God, your healer. What means I'm God, your healer? I'm your doctor. But what type of a healer? There is a healer, a doctor who comes when a person is sick, he cures him. God's type of healing is, he tells them all the sickness and the plagues that was at war in Egypt will not be on you, will never come to you. They will be, I will protect you in advance. God in this parsha, in this line, introduces the concept, of, the concept of preventive medicine. The right way of doing things. Not that we will be sick and God will cure us. God will never will make sure that we never get sick. And this is what God is telling us when a Jew is following God's law, not only is spiritually healthy, he will be physically healthy. Because when he's physically healthy, when, when he, what is today's world, the, the world of medicines believes very much in preventive medicine. The doctor tells you eat healthy, that you'll not have um, sugar, um, blood sugar in your, in your, in your uh, problems. You'll not have di diabetes, you'll not have other problems. You should exercise, God forbid, then you'll feel healthy and things like this. Then sometimes it's hard to do, it's hard to control yourself. But when you train yourself to control yourself, to do what God wants, then when the doctor tells you to do something, it's much easier. And when we do what God tells us, we have the ultimate doctor who is making sure that preventive medicine will never get sick. God is our healer. Thank you.